Our world is full of esoteric symbolism with various meaning and history. Symbolism is the language of the occult. It is the primary means of communication to the subconscious mind. With this presentation, I would like to briefly give my perspective on some of the peculiar symbols used throughout the ages. The Ouroboros, the Snake of Infinity, is a symbol almost as old as time, with the oldest known depiction going back about 7,000 years ago. The idea of infinity and the serpent of wisdom are two archetypes interwoven within the esoteric and occult. The Ouroboros signifies the internal nature of reality constantly moving in a cyclical structure. In ancient times, the serpent was seen as wise. Before there was the rhetoric of the rabbit hole, there was the snake hole, the serpent being able to go deep into the earth, new secrets. Just as the rabbit hole can be never-ending, the journey of the serpent, the wisdom seeker, can be a never-ending spiral in search of knowledge, for there are secrets within secrets, things to be known about things to be known. Life itself is movement, movement inward and outward, a never-ending cycle operating in fractal fashion. At the most micro of levels, we have the infinitesimal structure of the atom. When looked at from a slowed perspective, it too resembles a serpentine pattern moving within itself and back outward, as it pulsates the very life force needed to sustain all physical reality for eternity. The micro and macrocosm of the spiral are seen all throughout nature. This integral archetype of the serpent is expressed again in the very beginning of our conscious existence as humans within the holy text of the Judeo-Christian mythologies. It is played out in an act of incomprehensible magnitude, for this act would go on to set the stage of our entire dichotomy between the secret societies of the light and dark factions. The serpent gave us access to the knowledge of ourselves. Once we communed with the serpent, we realized who we really are. And according to the scriptures, we are like gods, for it is said in Genesis 3.22, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. 3.22, of course, being the ominous number of the Skull and Bones Society, the fraternity known for promoting the workers of the dark into the institutions of our world, and live forever, as it is stated in Genesis. The serpent, the Ouroboros, the quantum spiritual understanding, is the gateway to infinity. But this knowledge was forbidden by God, forbidden by the priest, and held available only to the dark faction after we split as a family and were led into the age of the Demiurge. I find it interesting that as children we are indoctrinated into what some would call the dinosaur lie. We are subtly traumatized from peering into the past by simply being told it was ravaged by reptilian giants who lived for some time but then were devastatingly destroyed by a natural calamity. And to this point, we are persuaded to believe that there is nothing worth investigating, for our existence as humans didn't start till much later. Funny, for in the Judeo-Christian institutions, we are also told that a reptilian-like being, the serpent, the Nakash, that dragon beast of old, was cast down from heaven and left to disparity. Both science and religion agree that in our legendary past, there existed a reptilian race that was banished by an unfortunate wrath from the skies. Is the serpent evil, or is it merely a gateway, a gatekeeper that reflects our own understanding? Moses was told to erect a cross with a metallic serpent on it so that whoever would look upon it would be healed. This foreshadowing of a redeemer on a cross was referenced to by John, who later said, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. John 3.14 Here we find the mention 
of eternal life again through the iconography of the serpent. The yogis of old have known of another serpent power for thousands of years, one that they call Kundalini Shakti. Kundalini Shakti is the coiled serpent that resides at the base of our spine, the sacrum. This fierce energy source, expressed as a serpent, has been held sacred and revered throughout many cultures. Similar to the serpent archetypes described before, it holds power and is a gateway to health, higher consciousness, and eternal life. When activated through various meditation techniques, Kundalini can be used to willfully heal the body and alter the mind into higher states of consciousness. The Staff of Hermes, or Rod of Asclepius, are but another representation of this power, with the staff being the spine, the serpents being the energy, and the wings atop being the elevated brain and mind. In this symbol, we see the serpent energy fully activated. Another serpentine structure residing within us that holds significance is of course that of our DNA strands. These are also represented by the staff of Hermes. DNA's role in esotericism is grand because it represents who we really are and where we come from. We are told by the holy text that we were made in God's image, and to be made in the image of another being would be to have been replicated from its DNA, to be born of its bloodline. This is why the story of Noah is so important. God didn't destroy the world because we were misbehaving. God destroyed the world because the bloodline between the fallen angels had become overbearing, apart from being an abomination to begin with. The destruction of the world through the flood was yet another attempt by the divine hierarchies to eliminate and erase the rebel celestials who held sacred knowledge which they sought to impart on us humans. The erasure of these beings caused an amnesia within our historical minds. We forgot who we once were. We lost a part of our celestial family due to this battle between the light and dark forces, both having the same knowledge but wanting to use them for different purposes. All that is left of the celestial rebels are archaic monuments and stories with imagery obscured and scattered about. The ancients knew more than we give them credit for. Their symbols reveal a myriad of secrets about the body and mind. Every symbol was a sigil for a micro and macro truth. The eye of the Egyptians can be found at the center of the human brain, both facilitators for the power of the mind. The splitting of the esoteric family into light and dark factions created a schism, a trauma to be played out over and over until reconciled. The ascended masters have transcended this material realm into higher dimensions only communicating through subtle sound and light to the receptive mind. These subtleties come through as downloads, miracles, and divine message. Our ancient family, who descended into the dark faction, took on the role of gatekeeper and judge of our worthiness. Through their drunkenness for power, they created the dogmatic priesthoods. The priesthoods of the institutional religions of today began long ago with the priesthoods of the first workers of the dark. They are the descendants of a long line of priests who guard the sacred knowledge of body and mind to be kept hidden from the naive slave humans. All around us, they exquisitely express the truth of our reality in a language only spoken by the adepts. The pine cone, the pineal gland, coveted by the ancients and venerated in so many different art installations, is the seat of the soul. It is the gate to which the soul can travel different dimensions, opened first by mastering the kundalini. The pine cone also demonstrates the fractal nature of life sustained by frequency. The underlying frequency that sustains all things is the very voice of God, eternally humming the Om to which the mystics attune their prayers. The pineal gland, the pine cone, the third eye are all symbols once so well understood by the ancients, but eventually forgotten through the condemnation of the dark priesthoods. The dark priesthoods sought to dogmatize everything, locking up the secrets, only allowing the patriarchal system of ritual contracts to be the gateway 
to enlightenment, the patriarchal era of the dark priesthoods caused an imbalance in the world. The pursuit of Gnosis was transformed into the initiation of the cult. Knowledge was prostituted, it was sold, and its weary seekers were left with a bad deal. Those who claimed to have the true secret were themselves led astray. But not all men of the age forsake themselves for the fanatical trends. Some closely guarded the secrets of the body and mind, obscuring them again in symbols, symbols of the cross, symbols of the sun, signs that expressed the penetrating light that shines down onto the mind, warming it with a gentle reminder of God's omnipresence. Some of these men who upheld the techniques of light were ironically burned at the stake, killed, and martyred for transgressing the patriarchal age of dogma. Our body is a living, functioning system that requires various means of sustenance. The secret is that our mind and body are to be harmonized in order to elevate from this realm. This is why we have been forbidden to seek the serpent and practice connecting to our higher self. Knowledge of self is the beginning. The reparation of our divine parents, the male and female, within is the next step. For too long, we've been out of balance, leading with the patriarchal vindictiveness of dogma, forgetting the sweet flowing embrace of the matriarchal component. The divine mother, the divine feminine, was also cast aside and neglected. Look again, and you'll see her all throughout the past. Without her, we simply could not survive. She is springtime and rebirth. The woman's life giving system, just like the Kundalini, has been represented throughout esoteric imagery. The clasped hands of our prayers are reflections of the only life-bearing sentience we know of in this physical realm. With our clasped hands in prayer, we return to our mother's vulva to commune with the other side from whence we came. The seasons of life on earth all hold their authority over us as we walk through them. Father Time, reimagined as Santa Claus, recounts our deeds through the year. Coupled with festivals long discontinued by our earthling family of the past, Christmas time, family time, was once a time of rejoicing in Gnosis through plant medicine ceremony. The tree and the lights, yet another symbol for the body and the brain, are all of the electrical impulses that shine throughout our body, that which is the tree of life. Santa's helpers, the little ones, the sprites of vague existence have always been here, phasing in and out of view. They have always been secretly an expression of the plant medicine itself, the spirit of the medicine. We once sat around in ceremony, gifting, giving thanks and praise, but now it's all been diluted into some capitalistic fervor, blurring the true purpose of our seasonal celebrations. Due to our imbalanced world, We've shifted everything and have caused it to rot into a demented shadow of what was. Santa, Father Time, and the Little Ones are now the patriarchal demiurge issuing us forth into Samsara along with the menacing gray aliens. The mischievous sprites of our past who would once induce us into altered states have now been replaced by the mechanical grays who seek to not give but take. The dark faction made manifest through our imbalance has come to reclaim what it feels we stole, what we misuse, that original power of higher consciousness. As the dark priests call to the greys like beacons of a lighthouse, the greys find us and swarm our institutions, rotting them with false hopes of power and riches. This is a sad tragedy repeated since time immemorial. We live in a world ruled by the imbalanced man and imbalanced woman, swaying to the dogma, the cult, the lust for initiation, rather than the pursuit of gnosis. The knowledge of our creator and of our ability to transcend our lower forms has been known. The symbol of the Star of David, as they call it, is the conjoining of the dualistic powers, the male and female, the pyramid, the square, the circle, have been symbols that represent the physical world, and to master them is to master this world. 
the light and dark factions seek the same goal. They simply have different means of doing so. The key has always been to go within, to utilize the body and mind connection. The ladder of Freemasonry is yet another representation of the spinal system of Kundalini. Climb the ladder. Reach infinity.